We'll have people joining us from Clubhouse. And uh, well, firstly, thank you, Jamie and Catherine for joining us. And for all the people who are attending on Clubhouse, YouTube stream, and, um, and obviously on Zoom. So thank you everybody for joining us today. So the reason I, we, we took this topic, which is not about AI or managing you know, engagement data or anything like that, is because um, through the last series of webinars we have run, um, you know, a lot of people have said, well, you know, yeah, it's really nice, interesting talking about nerdy, you know, techie subjects about. But we find that there are two common themes that keep coming up. And I was very curious to know what they were. And I thought it will be all about me and ProFuncom and how amazing we are. But actually, it turned out to be something totally different. A lot of people were talking about the creative that people were finding um, around um, some of the work we showcased, primarily Guinness Asset Management and London and Capital. And so I was, I'm like, you know, I know I shouldn't say the word, but I'm super excited that the head of brand from London and Capital have joined us on this webinar. And as well as Jamie, who helped the guys at Guinness Asset Management create, you know, their brand and their emails. So it's a slight diversion for us. Um, and it's actually really gonna be educational for me to talk about, you know, talk with two people who really, as far as, you know, when you're looking at marketing, speak, speak the language of marketing, which is very much un, not very well understood and very unrepresented when, you know, you are a wealth manager or a hedge fund or an asset manager. And where this kind of came about, is I started, you know, um, researching the subject. And I sort of found this report from Nielsen. And, you know, what Nielsen were talking about, they said the most important part of a marketing campaign is targeting. Recency, reach, brand, and context. So that, you know, those are important parts of it. But the most important part which was an absolute eye opener to me was creative. And the reason why it was, it, I was so stunned by it, because you think of, you know, some of the best brands that are out there, you know, you think of Apple, you think of Tesla, you think of, um, you know, Super Bowl adverts, you think of, um, you know, anything that, you know, changes your view of a product, something, you know, Skoda, you know, the, you know, the car that you wouldn't be seen dead in is now, you know, something that, you know, you aspire to. Um, and I actually had a friend recently who named their daughter Octavia, which I thought, hmm, that's, that's interesting, but, you know, it's an aspirational name, um, you know, and, it, and, and the creative part became really interesting. And the minute, you know, and you get this thing called confirmation bias is that, the more I started seeing great creative work, the more I kind of understood the journey that kind of may have taken place. This is kind of when, you know, when you're a fund, when you're a wealth manager, um, you know, you are up against different brands and the brands you're up against, you know, are, you know, well-known brands that, that we all know. And, you know, creative content is actually what motivates people to engage with your fund slash brand if you're not a Goldman Sachs or a Wellington or a Bain or a JP Morgan. And the thing is, you know, these guys, you know, the bigger managers, wealth managers, fund managers and the like, the bigger ones will always have share of voice. So effectively, whatever they say in whatever medium they say it in, you know, that quote I always say, you can't out BlackRock, BlackRock. You know, you just can't, it just doesn't happen. And so, so either, you know, you have to try and outspend them, which you're not gonna be able to outspend, or you're gonna have to think creatively. And, you know, the two, you know, the two things that we're gonna talk through today and why I call these, these brands, the, this creative, you know, the gold standard, because what we're gonna to cover today speaking to Jamie and speaking to Catherine is the kind of the minds that kind of go into 
creating, you know, right now what our our audience at ProFuncom are talking about are some of the best creatives they have seen. So, so we're going to go straight into it now. So, you know, sit back if you've got any questions, um, just put them in the um, in the chat, or there's a Q and A section you can you can ask questions to, and we you know we'll come back to them uh, once we finish. So the four things we're going to cover today, the Fab Four, um, you know, that famous quote, you know, who's the best drummer in the Beatles? Um, you know, who's, you know, is Ring, what's it like having Ringo as the best drummer in the Beatles? And they said, I think Lennon said, you know, Ringo, he's not even the fourth best drummer in the band. So uh, on that note, we're going to kind of get into the Fab Four. So we're going to look at design, we're looking at brand content, we're going to look at how do you communicate, and we're going to finally look at creative. So the first thing you know, we're going to talk about um, is the things you need to consider when you know, designing an email template. So who do we want to go with? Um, Jamie, do you, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, well, since design is my shtick, so to speak. Um, How street of you. <laughs> the um, you know, design is something that, that's often quite misunderstood. Um, people think when you see design or good design that it has to mm. be slick, it has to be polished. But sometimes that's not always the case. Uh, it can be rough, it can even look amateur, um, but it will often look authentic because of that. And really design is, is an approach that you take towards your communication. It's the conscious thought that you're taking as to how to present your message and your content. Mm. Um, on, on occasions that will mean that it needs to be heavily designed, it has to be really slick and sophisticated, like Apple advertising, for instance. But in other circumstances, for instance, if you're driving along a country lane and you see a farm that's selling farm produce, then a more, more authentic design will be mm. some handwritten text on a piece of cardboard. And if you saw instead in that, that kind of context, um, a really slick sign, you'd immediately become a little suspicious about whether that really is authentic farm produce or whether right. actually that's a big corporate trying to sell you, trying to hoodwink you. So when it comes to design, there are, there are lots of different approaches that you can take and you need to tailor those approaches to your target audience and the context that they're in. So it, it's who they are, the demographic, um, their, um, uh, the, the particular context they might be in. Um, mm. For example, um, if you're doing, uh, this is outside of email, but if you're doing advertising on the tube, then you have to convey a poster on the underground. You have to convey your message within a couple of seconds because someone is passing that and they've literally got two seconds right. to absorb what it's about and, and why they should be interested. Um, so you need to convey that message very clearly, very quickly, very succinctly. Um, whereas someone who's in front of their computer and you know that they're going to be in front of their computer for some time and that they can analyze what they're looking at um, and providing you can grab their attention and keep them interested in that communication, you can put more content in there, you can put more information. Um, but even then, there are limits. You know, right. the, the, the uh, uh, new media, um, looking at things on a mobile screen or on a desktop screen are very different experiences. And so you need to tailor that design for that particular media right. um, to make sure that it's effective, to make sure that you engage your user, etc. cetera. So, so what you're saying, Jamie, you know, it's really understanding the persona of the people you want to target. Absolutely, yeah. And your your in intelligence about that, um, that that particular prospect is absolutely key to understanding right. how you then design for it. Uh, right. Okay. Put together well, your content. Great. Yeah. Put together your um, uh, your key message. What you want yeah. them to do when they finished reading or um, experiencing that communication. Sure. So it's personas and experience. So, yeah. Catherine, what 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 are you, what are your views on you know things to consider when when designing? Obviously, the great email template that you guys have designed recently. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think it, it's all about communication. That, mm. That's why we design things to communicate. And it really does come down to three questions for me before I start an email. Number one, who's it for? Number two, what's your message? And number three, what do you want to achieve? And mm. if, before you even start bringing in how you're going to design it, you need the answers to those three questions. <clears throat> because once you... If, the most common thing that people say to me when they ask me to do something is, Catherine, can you make this look pretty? Right. And that that is honestly the last thing that's on my mind when I'm right. sitting down to design an email. It What matters, as Jamie was saying, it's, it's how you communicate. It's your intention. What are you trying to do? And you're trying to communicate. So you need to know what the message is, who it's for, who it's for, what your message is and what you want to achieve, what you want them to do after they've received that message. Um, and of course, you, you want your email to look good. And sure. that's where yeah. we can just, we'll discuss that later. But um, that's not, the, the, the two come together. Right. So in an ideal world, Catherine, you know, when somebody comes to you and says, make this pretty, um, what, what would you rather they say to you? I, I, that's fine. I know what they mean. Right. It's just that that's not the approach to take it. It matters what you intend to do. Right. So ultimately you're using brand and you're using design mm. to make it appealing and to make it um, something that people are drawn to. But if the information within that design isn't clear and right. doesn't speak to the people that you've, in, you've, uh, targeted for example right then it's it, it just it's just something that looks nice and it's meaningless yes so is that something you know jamie if that kind of happened to you would you push back on that or would you just kind of go um i know we've had this conversation today actually it's like well it is the client you know what how do you manage that 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 boundary yeah, I think it can be difficult when you've got a, a, a paying client and they're intent on doing something that you know is uh, either the wrong path or it's questionable on, the, on its approach. Jamie, um, you're going to have to speak up. You're a little okay, low. No problem. Uh, you know, for, fortunately, those occasions come up uh, few and far between. And yes, I will always push back because my job as a designer is to create, not just to create a pretty design, like Catherine mm. says, it, it's actually to create a functional design, something that achieves right. the results that the client wants. Um, and if it doesn't achieve those results, it doesn't matter how well designed it is, how many awards it might have got, it, it's, it's a failure from that client's point of view. So um, yes, I will try to explain how and why that might not work and why I need to know the information that I'm asking for in order to make that communication a successful communication um, and therefore a, a successful piece of design. So yeah, I, I think it's always worth pushing back, asking the questions that you need, you know, who is this aimed at? What are you trying to achieve for it, um, et cetera, in order right. to, to be able to get it onto the right track. Um, so, so what is this battle then and Catherine and Jamie, I'd be really interested to know between form and function. Ah, I've got a, a good example. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I was in the opticians the other day and right. they had a water cooler with some cups. And um, they were these. I've got something You've got one. I've got one. Oh, I made earlier. That's not a plant, everybody. That's not a plant. <laughs> So you can see this conical cup, and that's a perfect example of form and function and where the designer has got their, the answers to their three questions. Who's it for the customer? What's the message drink from me? And what do they want to achieve? They, they wanted to stop people from putting cups down on the surface. Right. But, which they achieved is you can't, you, you put it in the recycling, but it's, but it also looks pretty. But that wasn't the number one priority. That's just because the designer used good proportion yeah. and, and thought, thought how, you know, how to design this. They used design, but that yeah. wasn't the 
it's it's a it, it, it's a combination form and function yeah it is and you know ladies and gentlemen boys and girls if you took if you took that brief and you gave it to an engineer who wasn't creative you wouldn't get that solution and that's the whole thing you know creativity is not doing something that's logical because if you do something that's logical the destination is where everybody else is going to go you see and and that and that is you know the thing that i've been kind of studying with this guy rory sutherland where he said you know if you go to a steering group and ask them to design a drink that's going to outsell coca-cola what they'll do is they'll say right we need to make a drink that's double the volume tastes better and it's half the price and you go to walmart you go to costco you go to you know tesco's and they've got their own brands trying just to do that trying to compete with coca-cola and they fail but what the genius of red bull is is that the, the brief obviously was to compete with coca-cola so what they did in something that is kind of form and function and exactly what you're saying catherine they said well what we'll do is we'll take a drink make it double the price half the volume and make it taste vulgar there you go you know how and that is the beauty of you know having creative minds in your team and again this is something that i've been very lucky to have jamie on my team and obviously catherine you know, looking at her work you can you can really see it coming together and you know if you if you get the time if you look at johnny ive from apple who was the brains behind their creative as well as you know look at some videos of steve jobs uh, you'll actually see how that kind of twisted mind works. No offense, Catherine, and no offense, Jane. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you've been called worse, right? Okay, so that's design. So great, thank you very much for that. So the next thing we're going to look at um, is brand and content. So, um, so Catherine, you know, what's your views on brand and content, and where, and how do you kind of get that that mythical balance? I think that when we think of brand, we think of identity. So we think of Red Bull or Coca-Cola or Nike, because that's what it is. Mm. Uh, that changes when you are the designer sat in front of your computer. When you're the designer trying to make an email, brand is no longer your identity. Brand is your box of tools. Right. Um, Brand delivers your content, and that's the relationship as a designer. Right. So, and secondly, brand is your content. So when you choose an image, for example, mm -hmm. that's your, your brand. And when you choose your tone of voice, that's, that's your brand. Right. So how, how do you keep that consistent? You, well, well, I think you need to know your brand. Right. And if you don't have brand guidelines, you need you need them. When when I first joined London Capital, we didn't right. have yeah. brand guidelines. We had a logo and we had colours and fonts, but we didn't have actual brand guidelines. Um, so you need to know your brand guidelines or build them. Um, and it's a good good idea to to right. even if you if you've joined a company, you've been there for a year or so, um, go back to the brand guidelines, refresh, refresh yourself with them, really know them, get, get them so that you, you're complete, that they become, they, they're, they're, they're your language. That's how yeah. you'll, you'll be speaking. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like, you know, going back to something you've previously done. Do you find that, you know, as time goes on, people deviate from whatever the brand guidelines were or do they, people kind of stay within those boundaries in your experience? I mean, they, they are brand guidelines, um, which implies that you, you know, that there is room mm. for them to go, but, that, but uh, um, I, I think it's, I think just, really understand what you've got there right and, um, yeah they're, they're guidelines not rules i suppose yeah but that but that said sometimes brand the difference between being on brand and off brand 
is the matter of a few millimeters. You, know, you really need to look closely at what your margins are. Right. Um, whether or not your 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 headings are in caps or not. You know, and it may all of those really small details mm. matter. They do, and I, I'm sitting here feeling very guilty because, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, if you were to ask me, Catherine, you know, 18 years at ProFuncon, what fonts we use, you know, what do we capitalize or not capitalize? It's, I mean, it's scary. Uh, and to think that, you know, we've got so much content out there. Um, yeah, I mean, Jamie, how, how, you know, how does this, how is, what's your view of the balance between brand and content? Uh, I, I think, uh, as Catherine says, that they're very Jamie, much you're going to have to speak up. I think your microphone as is. As Catherine says, they're very much interlinked. The, um, you know, your, your brand is your content. Your content is a brand. It's not just your identity. It's your tone of voice. It's how you write. Um, it's the, the images that you use, the videos you might use, uh, all of that material um, contributes towards it. Right. Um, saying that, like Catherine says, uh, guidelines are just guidelines, and there are occasions where um, the, the, the design or the medium uh, means that you need to, you have to uh, veer slightly away from them on occasion. Right. Um, and th there are always going to be cases where uh, the guidelines don't cover what you're doing, and you, you have to try and create something that fits within the spirit of those guidelines, and you're, you're the pioneer. You're around right here charting new territory i'd also yeah, and, and we've found that you know whether you know when we started you know it was a case of well you know we're just sending emails out logo color will be fine will be fine and then you kind of go into the world of linkedin you go into the world of vimeo you know we're in the world of clubhouse now and you know um you know and how the guidelines have to evolve as as well jamie you know that, that that's yeah. kind of part of this Part of this as well and you know I, I look at emails you know we sent out you know even beginning of last year to now and there are just subtle differences just creep in because we're just kind of copied and pasted something you know and but and we you know they, we just we're just not big enough to police it so um you know it almost feels like there is it's down to the individual, Jamie. Would you say, or is there a is there a bigger context to this? Well, but you know, part of that is is uh, why you have guidelines in order right. to help help your staff adhere, broadly speaking, within them. Um, but saying that, you know, gu guidelines shouldn't be static. They shouldn't mm. be set in stone and never change. Up for review on a kind of regular basis, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. If you look at yeah. big companies like Apple. The, the brand that they had 20 years ago is is um, bears you know very little resemblance. Yeah, to I, I agree. Now. I agree. You know the little multicolor logo with stripes. The the their markets changed. They're now they're now targeting more um, consumer orientated customer base. Uh, so right. they, they've had to change in order to accommodate those new markets. Those for new sure. Areas. So so on to on to the next part of, I suppose would be you know, you've got your brand, how do you address a rebrand if you want to change something? I mean, Catherine, would, have you, when you, you, you're probably in pole position to talk us through a bit of that. It's a big job. Okay. <laughs> Not to underestimate from what you're saying. Uh, no. No. No, mm -hmm. I, I, I get that. And, and when you were doing your rebrand at London Capital, was it a change in values or was it just redefining the company's values to, to you know, to do the rebrand? I'd be quite well, curious to know. It wasn't a change in values as such, it's more of a defining of values. Right. And um, we, as I said, we at first we didn't have brand guidelines. We had a logo font mm. and colors, but that that's not a brand. Right. Um, so we did a lot of work um, and it took us a couple of years of really of all of the partners being involved and lots of interviews and discussions about really defining who we are as a company. Um, it's a big job. Wow, years. But, um, but I think that the, with the lockdown recently, I think there is room for um, 
digital guidelines that we all need to we probably most people don't have well they may but um digital guidelines are needed are need to be written we, we're doing ours at the moment right and what would that include well everything that you use digitally it works in a different way so you need to just consider all the aspects it's on screen um how things work right does that include Zoom backgrounds as well? <laughs> Definitely need a Zoom. I, I noticed yours. That's new. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, ours is quite funny because depending on how I, I tilt my head, uh, <laughs> it says Profond Com or Profond Con. And it has been <laughs> it has been noted. And, you know, and I've, I've tried, you know, all kinds of other things. And obviously everybody knows, you know, I'm actually today I'm actually sitting in an office. But you know, when you've got clutter that sits behind, I'm so busy being feeling I'm being digitally judged by all the kind of clutter. So I've got this like field of vision where everything is very, very clear and looks like I'm disciplined and I am you know, worthy of a title like CEO. But if you look around, I'm just like a teenager's bedroom, you know? <laughs> so, but it, you know, and you know, Amazon deliveries and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you is that I think as we do more Zooms, as we do, you know, as we're not in the office that much, you know, and we are so digital now, it's, you know, having, having that consistency. I mean, we've done something very, very simple, but I've actually found really effective. We're using a bit of software that allows all our email signatures to be exactly the same, as in messaging, name, phone number. It's really quite clever what it does. And if we want to say promote a webinar, we can just do that in our email signatures. So, and, and it just stays consistent throughout, um, which I've found to be really quite, quite, quite useful. So, you know, we are, you know, we are slowly building standards um, and, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, you're absolutely right, is that, um, you know, you know, the brand, you know, what is, is, is what you, is the tools, you know, it's all the tools that kind of sit within there uh, is what you, is what you, you're kind of building your emails and your designs with. So, so super, look, that was really, really useful. I did not think it would take years to do a rebrand. Uh, I was, we we're did just have a, thinking. Yeah, there were a few changes of man, in management, which slowed it down a bit. Right, right, okay. Well, hopefully my job's safe for now, but uh, yeah, I know, but, in, uh, that, but you know, you look at the outcome, right? You, you, you look at the outcome of what you guys have done, um, it, it is, you know, and, I, and I've been very lucky to be close to it. Uh, it's, you, you, you know, we've got 300 users of our product and, and, you know, you guys are, you know, in the top two. I would say one, but, you know, got to be, uh, I suppose, impartial, is that a word? Yeah, it is, of course it is. Okay, so, so design, brand, content, you know, we're on to communication now and how you communicate your values, how you commit your investment strategy, um, your attitude to risk and, and performance. I think, I think, Jamie, this kind of ties in a little bit with the persona thing you spoke about earlier on. Um, you mean about the, how you present the, the message? Yes. Yeah, the authenticity of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the, you know, if you, you can sometimes get the design wrong or the design could mm -hmm. be um, you know, crude, but you can still be successful with that communication because the, the quality of what you're trying to communicate comes over really easily, comes over really well. And that can right. happen through good copywriting or um, good imagery that's been used. So, you know, even if the design is weak, it can sometimes still be successful, but you can't have a successful communication without, without a good message to communicate. Mm. Um, you know, without being able to convey that quickly and easily. Uh, and clearly good design is going to help there, whether that's a conscious uh, decision to produce something that, that looks um, less slick or unsophisticated or perhaps rough and ready. Um, you know, something that might be a plain text email, for instance, that, that can be a yeah. choice to use because in that context, it's going to work well at, at communicating that message. Whereas in other contexts, you want something that looks very slick, very sophisticated. 
Yeah, and 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 and, and that's what we've seen, you know. So, you know, and, and Catherine is, you know, in what she said is, look, make this pretty, um, you know, that kind of narrative, you know, in very much, you know, when when you're talking about emails for for managers, for fund managers, portfolio managers, and wealth managers, you know, they they kind of go down. Well, don't put this out if our performance is not good or let's not put this out. And, and that has kind of been the case probably since when we started ProFundCom. It's like, oh, we only want to communicate good news and we only want to communicate, you know, in something that looks pretty. But I think what they miss, and this is the kind of the thing that Catherine was talking about values and what you stand for, is actually what, what investors want to know about is not just your performance. Actually, we did a survey with the guys um, at Harvest, and they kind of came back with, well, the three things that investors want to know about uh, are what are your values, what's your investment strategy, what's your attitude to risk, and then what's your performance in that order. And it was totally contrary. It's almost like the Red Bull Coca-Cola thing. It's totally contrary to what every single customer of ours was doing. And, and slowly, as, as we're kind of seeing this, is customers are slowly edging their way, edging their way into, into creative. Um, so Catherine, how have you found, you know, it, you know doing what you've been doing, um, communicating, you know, these kind of things to people you're designing for? Yeah, it's really challenging. Um, and I feel that these complicated values and strategies don't belong in an email, but if you can, often mm -hmm. the, the essence of these strategies do come down to some very simple uh, words and, I, and right. ideas. And if you can um, define them into these very simple statements, you then provide yourself with um, some micro content. And in the way that, that the email works is uh, we've got, we're using headlines mm -hmm. that will draw, if, you're, if your email is targeted correctly, will speak to the person in an instant. Because I think the way that we, we all work these days, when we're on, on social media, for example, we scroll, we click, we scroll, we don't click. Yeah. But the point is that we're in control. The viewer is in control. And if you and you've got, as you say, you've got eight seconds, but I think you've probably got three seconds or mm. you know, less. Um, and so if you don't get your message across instantly, you're lost. Yes. But what, what the, so what you do is you create some, some very small defined uh, communication words that then will draw your, your viewer in to click, to take control. And that's where you take them through to your website or to wherever else you want to then fully un unravel all of the information. That's how I, how th that's where I am with it. Right, so that sounds like some kind of magic. So what are these words and how do you find them? I think you need a good copywriter. Right, right. And it's a copywriting, is there a reason you wouldn't have somebody like a fund manager or a marketing manager writing copy, which tends to be the case, as opposed to getting someone who's professional? Um, so of, often we're, we have to do what we have to do, but it's all, you know, professionals do it better. Yes. Well, the interesting thing is, and those, those of you who are on the call, is, you know, all the work we do at ProFundCom one of the biggest changes in our world is we actually hire, we actually use on a regular basis as part of our team, a professional copywriter. And it's, it's got, it's a, this, this is going to be recorded, um, this webinar, and the recording gets sent to our copywriter. Our copywriter then does a couple of clever things. He'll write a white paper and then he'll make micro content from that white paper to then, so we can then use on social media and we can, we can use on our website, we can use in promoting other events we're doing. So from you know, the best part of an hour, 
um, that we are recording this, we're going to generate five to six bits of content that right. we can then repurpose. Um, and, you know, it is, and, you know, and the thing is, you know, I'm not a writer um, by definition. I'd love to think I am. I love to think I can do many things. But when you give something to a professional, it's a bit like, aha, uh -huh, I get it why I'm paying this guy. And it's a bit like, I don't know if anybody in the audience has done jobs that are like, yeah, I can do this. And then you realize, actually, that has just devalued my house by 30%. And I can tell you once I changed the tap and uh, five days later after being flooded, I just called a plumber. And that was the last of DIY. So yeah, you, you definitely need the professionals in, um, you know, if you want to kind of move your brand, move the needle on your brand and how you're perceived. Um, so, and, and, you know, build on your creative. So, right, we're almost on the home straight. Thank you, Jamie and Catherine, so far for, uh, for your input. Mm -hmm. One I'm pretty most intrigued about. And thank you for everybody who's, who's out there in um, club work, clubhouse land and YouTube land and, uh, and people on, on, on this Zoom. Uh, creative, you know, how do you make your message sing and how do you get it to differentiate? Um, Catherine, let's start with you on this one. Most important thing mm. to remember is that creativity is all about play. So you need to play. have fun. Yeah, that's what it is. It's all about right. play. You the, really important to approach your work in a positive way. Um, it's often very challenging um because we're, we're often under pressure um things are wanted very 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 quickly short deadlines and there's not time for a redo you're having to just get it done straight off so see it as a challenge mm -hmm. stay positive um and enjoy it and you can really tell when someone's enjoyed making an email because it will have an energy to it right it makes a huge difference um and another i think a couple of other things would be to, um, when I first start building an email, don't zoom in and do one bit and then another bit and then another bit. Zoom right. out at one hundred percent and sort of place the pieces. So answer your three questions so that you know your priorities and you've got your hierarchy about what's the most important bit. Place that and then build the other elements in there at a hundred percent view. And then gradually, gradually build it up again and tighten it up. Um, obviously, there's lots of design rules that you can take take into consideration, like proportion and balance sure. and all of those things, and your brand. Um, yeah, there's a few few things there. Right, and you know, at the very basic level, how much does things like color and palettes come to being or again or is that kind of another realm sorry say that again i was gonna say at what point in the creative do things like color font um you know the color palettes you use the tones you use um you know how how do they fit into the creative process well that you know that's where your brand comes in i mean right. I, I used to I used to do um, something where I'd always work in black and white, and then and then bring in the color, right? Because because, because of the contrast. But I would I would say just always use your brown colors and just right. build from there. You can I, also. You, you, sorry, Catherine. Carry I, on, please. I was going to say another thing you can think about with Profundcom is. Um, building assets outside of Profundcom. For example, you could uh, resize, use PowerPoint. Um, if you don't have access to things like InDesign or Adobe InDesign and things, mm -hmm. um, you can use PowerPoint, resize the size of the um, page format to say a 10 centimeter square. Right. And you can design yourself a little uh, JPEG using some of your micro content or an image of right you know, save it out as a jpeg and then drop that into profund.com and that becomes a clickable link right right okay 
Okay, that's that's my homework. Well, that that's really use that's really useful to know. I, I just love that kind of zoom out view, Catherine. You have on it really makes a difference. Yeah, you know, and and I think I'm so I'm personally guilty of always being on my keyboard, like now, now, now. I'll do it now, now, now. Not kind of having those aha moments to say, you know, that's what really we should be doing. And I can recognize in other people's design. Because um, it's about balance. that's where the balance comes in. So mm. if you're zoomed out, you can see how things are working together and you'll get the flow. Yeah. But as if you start at the top and work down, you're, you, you've yeah, done you so much up, work. You right? end up with the Pro Funcom logo, which is four, four colors. <laughs> but that may change. That may change. So, Jamie, what are your thoughts on the, on the, on the, on the uh, yeah, again, you know, how you differentiate your emails? I'd concur with Catherine on, on the approach. I personally start uh, very similar to Catherine with a, a hand-drawn visual in black pen. Right, um, I, okay. I start in pretty much the same way. I will iterate those. I'll come up with lots of ideas. Um, some of them won't work. Some of them will work. Some of them need development. So again, it's a case of getting out down as many ideas as you can then taking the strongest of those, iterating them, refining them. And most of all, when it comes to email, simplifying. I can't mm. emphasize that enough. Right. Simplify, simplify, simplify. If, right. you've, if you've got an email that is really heavily structured with lots of moving parts, lots of little bits and pieces, you're not going to clearly communicate what you need to communicate. Got it. Got it. Um, wow. okay. Sometimes it's unavoidable because of the nature yeah. of the content that you need to put in there. But if you can simplify the uh, introduction to that more complex content, that's all the better that you can actually catch your prospect, catch your right. investor and keep them interested. Got it. Black and white design. I'm, I'm liking this. I'm learning so much. Right. <laughs> We've got one question. I think we're kind of nearing our end. Um, so it says brand delivers your content and, you know, um, and thank you, Hagen, for this question. But what about newcomers among investment companies, so emerging managers, or you know those? Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. How about how do smaller managers who don't have a design team? How can they how can they at least start on this journey? Catherine, any thoughts? I think you have to make some decisions. I think you have to take time out and just look at what you have got. Um, and make decisions, uh, uh, try to do some research. Um, I know it's really difficult because often in this industry, um, marketing and design are very low down on the yes. list of priorities. You know, it's all about the advisors. And, totally, totally. Um, whereas if you were in an agency, a design agency, you, you know, you're the important ones, but, um, it is difficult, but I, I, I don't think you can do it unless you start making those decisions about yeah. what, what kind of company you are, what you stand for, you know, what your values are. You have to. You uh, have yeah. To and if you're an emerging manager, there's probably only going to be one or two or three of you. So it's not that you, it's going to take a year to do. It's something so you, you go for a drink and you have some conversations. Yeah. Yeah. What, who, why, why did we build this company? Who are we? What do we want? You know? Yeah. What we stand for what do we believe in? Who yeah, we, and, who, and like like we like you said. Friend. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, okay, and and another question is, um, this is quite interesting. Is how do you build your brand after you've rebranded? Do you mean develop your brand? Yeah, so let's say you know you're 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 a company, you're a manager, and you've just rebranded yourself. How do you kind of promote that brand? I, I suppose is that the question, Hagen? Okay, that doesn't. I don't think Hagen's. It is. It is that is the question. Yeah. So once you've you've done your rebrand, how do you promote that brand, the new brand? Um. By, by doing it really well. Yeah. 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 Shouting no. about it. Be, be yeah. Loud, I mean, you, you've, vocal, it, it is. Loud. It is. And, you know, it's it's the thing. I've always said this. And Victoria, who's on the call, is just going to say, Paul, just shut up. But you can't out BlackRock BlackRock. You just can't. Because they've got so much voice in the market. 
and you know it's 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 how you know you communicate and it's all about communicate 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 creative 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 and you know and then copy 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 it's all those things and it's not it's not the the and again performance is like bottom of that list that we spoke about right it's at the bottom so it's not to get hung up on not to get hung up on on uh, your performance it's more to kind of is to really get hung up on how much you're communicating and having the best systems in place to monitor what's working and what's not working. And, you know, and, and why that becomes important um, to have those systems in place is because, um, you know, um, it's because right now the, um, hang on a second, if I can, Oh dear, I'm having uh, technology issues. Um, anyhow, I don't think I, I don't think I've got this working properly. But uh, oh, hold on a sec. Here we go. Can you see that, guys? So that is basically the investor journey is completely digital, and and that's kind of the point that you know I I, I explain is that unless you're monitoring and analyzing this content, you won't know how well something's performing. And, you know, we know, um, you know, that the emails that, you know, you've generated, Catherine, have got like, you know, an incredible open rate, you know, far, and that's why it kind of came to our notice because it was designed with all those in mind. So, so yeah, so Hagen, thank you for that question. I hope that answered it. Um, is, we're about done now. So um, we'll we'll be on for a few more minutes to take some questions. Um, if there's anyone else um, who wants to ask our illustrious panel on the thing that we don't talk about much, which is marketing, you know, it's it's normally what are the three things that get cut in a crisis? It's first class travel, biscuits in the meeting room, creative and marketing. I think it's the other way around, marketing first. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> well, I was at Lehman Brothers when that all happened. So, uh, I yeah, I did notice where the biscuits, <laughs> um, because that's to me the most important. Okay, well, look, we've got no more questions coming through, but that's great. So I suppose have a lovely Friday afternoon, everybody. Once again, thank you very much, Catherine, for joining us. Um, I hope it wasn't too of a painful experience. Not too bad. <clears throat> Not too bad. I survived. No. Okay. But no, it was, it was really, really useful, Catherine. Thank you very much. And Jamie, as always, pleasure, pleasure to uh, you know share share notes with you. So thank you both. And like I said to our audience, uh, this will all be the replay will be available shortly after this, and we'll be you know uh, circulating the summary of this in a white paper in the coming weeks. So thank you all very much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay.